Hello, my name is Phil Easter, historian and writer from Baltimore, Maryland, also known as the Amazing Memory Man. We're recording today on Sunday, June 18th, 2023. This is story number 29 on my YouTube channel, which is Phil Easter, the Amazing Memory Man. Today we will share baseball memories. I am joined by my friend Noah Smart, who is from uh, Baltimore, but tell us a little more. Noah, welcome. Thanks, Phil. Thanks for having me. You're most welcome. Yes, so I, I did grow up in Baltimore, uh, but not Baltimore, Maryland. I grew up in Baltimore, Ohio, uh, which is a village and is a lot smaller than Baltimore, Maryland. So think more cornfields than row homes. Uh, small uh, central Ohio uh, town, Baltimore. And you became interested in baseball at a young age, I'm sure you did. You played Little League, right? Yeah, yeah. For, for, for whatever reason, baseball was just something that made so much sense to me. I loved it from the time I could... Uh, could walk and I played Little League and uh, I actually did play for the Baltimore Orioles but again my hometown <laughs> and I, I, I wore the Orioles proudly oh. and, and now as a transplant of course I'm a huge <laughs> Orioles fan. So. That's great. Yeah. <laughs> it really is. And, uh, um, yes well I, I grew up in downtown Baltimore. Uh, I'm from the Mount Vernon area and well that is a very nice area for cultural things. Uh, you have the Walters Art Gallery nearby and of course the the George Washington Monument and the main branch of the Pratt Library, the Central Library for Baltimore is just a few blocks from where we live. And the Basilica of the Assumption, the oldest Roman Catholic Cathedral in the whole United States. So there's some interesting landmarks in the Mount Vernon area, but it's not an area for sports too much. Uh, so growing up with a few other boys who knew downtown, we had to improvise and we played on a parking lot with a rubber ball, there were just four of us usually, played two against two uh, on a parking lot near the Walters Art Gallery, which is still there, by the way, over 50 years later, that parking lot. And we would play there and our, our kind of baseball and touch football and throughout the several years. But I did get to go to a summer camp uh, six years in a row between 1962 and 67. So for usually between two to four weeks each summer in those years, I did get to play on a real field at Baseball Diamond, at least with some other boys as well. So I had some experience. Uh, I never played Little League exactly, but the camp experience was nice too. And the counselors would uh, pitch to both teams. So they'd, they'd pitch rather slow, so it wasn't too hard to hit the ball at least. You wouldn't strike out too often, at least you'd hit the ball. But, all the other positions were the young boys, so it was still a lot of fun oh, yeah. at, the, at that day camp, which was at the Mount St. Joseph High School, where I later went to high school as well. So uh, we usually went swimming after we played baseball in those hot afternoons in July and August, oh, yeah. and that was nice. Then I'd come home in the evening and have a dinner, and sometimes go out around 7 o'clock and play with my friends at the parking lot too. So I still got to play a lot, even though I never wore a uniform so oh, much, awesome. but it was fun. Point is, it was a lot of fun. And started to go to Oriole games, I believe, in 1965. And the next year, 1966, the Orioles won their first ever American League pennant. And what a special year that was. And made it to the World Series against the highly favored Los Angeles Dodgers. The Dodgers had two of the best pitchers in baseball then, oh, yeah. like Don Drysdale and Sandy Koufax. And uh, they had won the World Series in 1965, the year before. So they were favored to win again in 1966. But the Orioles won the first two games in LA uh, by a score of five to two and six zero. And they came back to Baltimore and on Saturday, October 8th, 1966, they won. Paul Blair, who wore this number six, uh, Paul Blair hit a home run. The Orioles won one nil, as you say in soccer. That's right. Yep. <laughs> and the next day, also Sunday, <laughs> October 9th, they won again by the simple score of one to zero. Wow. So they won four straight games over the mighty Los Angeles Dodgers. Wow, they shut them out. Oh, That's they did. Three to five, uh, wow. three to four games were shutouts. Incredible. And that was uh, just amazing how the Orioles, with a lot of young players, uh, but also they had. 
that year, Frank Robinson came over from Cincinnati. He was 30 years old, and the Reds gave up on him. They thought he was you know, past, past his prime. Well past he his went prime. on to win yeah. an MVP. <laughs> and here he wins the Triple Crown, Jeez. which only about 12 players in baseball history have ever done. Uh, that means you lead your, your league in batting average, home runs, and runs batted in. The same player. It's very rare to win it's all best, three. Yeah. And wins the most valuable player of the whole year in the whole American League and also most valuable player of the World Series as he hit two home runs in that series. It was just a wonderful time. It was so hard to get tickets for that. My mom and I went down to a post office. She had to try to get them in, but so many people were applying. But you made it. No, we didn't. No, you didn't did make it. I, I got to every World Series after that. The Orioles were in at least one game. We did not. We had to watch the games on TV, but it was still a lot of fun. Wow. And it was very hard to get tickets. A good friend of mine named Jack, uh, his father uh, knew Brooks Robinson, and he was able to get tickets for those two games in Baltimore. That's amazing. It, it, it really is. Uh, but uh, the city was so proud at that first World Series championship to, to upset the Dodgers. The uh, bookmakers, before the World Series began, said the odds of the Orioles winning four straight was 100 to 1 against. That. Wow. Yet it happened. It was the upstart Orioles. It was something. They made it happen. It really was. Then in 1969, the Orioles won the American League pennant again. They would face the New York Mets in the World Series. That's and amazing. Game two was on October 12th, uh, 1969. The Orioles won the first game on October 11th. My mom and I got tickets for game two on October 12th. We went out to Memorial Stadium. Uh, unfortunately, the, the Mets beat the Orioles two to one. And then they went to New York and the Mets won three straight to win the World Series. That was an upset. The Orioles were favored then to win. But the Mets did win. And the, but the next year, 1970, was also very special. The Orioles made it back to the World Series and faced the Cincinnati Reds, uh, Frank Robinson's old team. And, and so uh, the other Robinson, the great Brooks Robinson of the Orioles, is considered the best defensive third baseman of all time in baseball history. He won 16 Golden Gloves every year between 1960 and 75. Wow. Just incredible. They dominated that position. And he was also, well, not the highest, highest type batting average. He still had timely hits a lot. And that series, he, he, he performed very well defensively as expected, but also had a 429 batting average. And he was voted most valuable player of that World Series. Absolutely. And my, my number one baseball memory ever was on October 15th, 1970. I saw game five, the final game of that series. The Orioles won three straight and then lost the fourth game. I watched those on TV. I was able to get the next game. I saw the Orioles win the World Series in wow. person. And that was so wonderful, you know, it really was. That's wild. Just two days before my 18th birthday on October 17th, an early birthday present. And I was so happy to see that game in person. So I bet you're glad they lost that one game yes. so you could be so, there for the, right, the winning game. Right, so I, can, I, I was able to get there. <laughs> the only time you rooted against the Orioles. Just one, just one, right. But I, I knew I could get the next day. There was a certain reason I knew I could get there the next day. Yep. And uh, it just worked out. The timing just worked out very well. The Orioles won 9-3 to three and the series four games to one. Now next year they, they played Pittsburgh Pirates in the World Series. The Orioles won three pennants in a row. Not many teams have done that, really. Three league pennants in a row. They played the Pirates, and they lost in seven games. Uh, a, a close series, you know, four games to three. The final game wasn't my birthday. <laughs> I was watching oh, some TV. That would have been great. Exactly, October 17th. They lost two to one. But, but I went to the first and sixth games in person. Those two games, game one and game six. And they won those two games. The Orioles did. Uh, so wow. still an exciting time there. The late 60s, early 70s. Very exciting time for oh, yeah. baseball in Baltimore. Now, Noah, you, you were a fan earlier on. You were a fan of the Cincinnati Reds, weren't you? Can you tell yeah. us a little bit about that? Yeah. I, so I grew up in Central Ohio, and the the hometown radio broadcast was for the Cincinnati Reds. And if you went to my grandparents' house, anytime there was a Reds game on, they had it on the radio. No matter what they were doing, Marty Bredeman was announcing the Reds game. Uh, at my grandparents house. So I went to a number of Reds games when they played at Riverfront Stadium and uh, I had the fortune of being 11 years old in 1990. I'm, I'm dating myself, but uh, 
the Reds went wire to wire, meaning they were never out of first place from day one until they swept the World Series from the heavily favored Oakland Athletics uh, something. in October. From, from the opening day, they were opening day on there. Yeah, and, and amazingly, so, so this is a fascinating season. They were 41 and 21, and then they played 500 ball the rest of the time. They ended up at 91 and 71. That's incredible. So they had, but, they, but <laughs> even so, they led. Such a good early start yeah. that they had that lead. Ma yes. Making hay in the early days, well, and that's like the Orioles in 2023. You get out in front, you right. pad your lead, then you can do that. Well, that's great, Noah. That, that's a great memory yeah. of World Series. Where were you in 1990? Were you still living in Baltimore, Ohio? Then? Yeah, yeah. I was in fourth grade, I think, okay. and at the height of my my love of baseball, playing Little League, yeah. and you know the the heroes on that those teams were. Uh, Eric Davis, who hit a two-run home run in the very first game of the World Series against Dave Stewart. Um, Paul O'Neill, uh, so many amazing, uh, talented players. Lou Pinella was the manager. Uh, Chris Sabo was on that team, and it was just a wire-to-wire -wire team. They led every, every day of the season, and they won it all. I remember watching the Reds on TV in uh, 75 and 76 when they won those World Series. The Red Machine, know, yeah. You know, something, yes, with Pete Rose and uh, George Foster, uh, Johnny Bench, of course, yeah. great catcher. When I first started getting into baseball, those those players were still on the team, but they were they were retiring and, le and, uh, and leaving the game. Uh, but Johnny Bench, I think, played to 84, 85. Uh, Pete Rose was a player manager in 1986. So right. he both managed and played on the field. Uh, he played 25 seasons. Did you know that in 1963, when his rookie year, uh, in the last game of that season, I think he was playing second base at that time. He played many different positions. The great St. Louis Cardinal player, Stan Musial, in the last game of that season, between St. Louis and Cincinnati, he grounded out to Pete Rose at second base for the last time he batted. So at the end of, the end of one great career and was still of another. the first year ending of, of a, just the first year ending of another great player, but Pete Rose, who would have the most hits in baseball history. I That's remember fun. watching that on TV in 1985 when he passed Ty Cobb for the oh, most yeah. hits ever. Yeah. One just amazing, and and I love stories like that because it bridges a gap between generations of baseball players. And you realize, you, yeah. you played 16, 20, 25 years in a league as a elite athlete is is an amazing feat in itself. It really is. It's just, just a, there was a player long ago in the era of Babe Ruth and Ty Cobb named Eddie Collins. He played twenty five years also. I think mostly for the Chicago White Sox and some with the Philadelphia Athletics too. And he was a second baseman was just about his whole career. He ended up with a 333 batting average. That wow. sounds funny, it's exactly <laughs> tremendous One out of every too. three times getting a hit. Yeah, yeah. And uh, I'd just like to mention too that the high school I went to here in Baltimore called Mount St. Joseph. And for many years, they usually have a pretty good baseball team. And in 1976, was the 100 year anniversary of Mount St. Joseph. It was founded in 1876. So, of course, every year, every class has a yearbook, but some people put together in 1976 a special centennial book of 100 year history and a lot of photographs of Mount St. Joseph, uh, including many sports teams. And way back sometime around probably 1912 or 13, there's a photograph in that book, I'm pretty sure it's one photograph of a young pitcher for another Catholic school in Baltimore called St. Mary's Industrial School at the time by the name of Babe Ruth, who pitched against Mount St. Joe at least one time. At least <laughs> I one imagine time. he was probably pretty good when he did <laughs> yes. too. Because uh, when, when he went up to the majors in 1914, he was a pitcher for the first six seasons with the Boston Red Sox before he went to the Yankees in 1920. 
Yeah. He won 90 some games and lost only 40 some in those six seasons. Amazing. Won about twice as many games as he lost. That's Even amazing. as a left handed pitcher. But because he could hit so well, he then made baseball history in so many other ways. You know? Yeah, a two a two way player <laughs> yeah. like like uh, Shohei Ortani. I yes. mean, just amazing. What to be able the young to do man's both doing now in baseball? Oh yeah, with the, with the Angels, right? Absolutely. Yeah. Yep. It, it is something. To see someone can pitch well and also hit. Very rare to do both so well. And uh, uh, and of course, Oriole Park opened in 1992. Uh, oh, I. I went to the last three games ever played Memorial Stadium yeah. that weekend in 1991, I should mention, October 4th, 5th, and 6th. I went three days in a row. And that was the one year I went to as many as 20 baseball games. I usually averaged four or five for many years, but I went to 20 games the last year at Memorial Stadium. But the first year at Oriole Park, I went to, uh, I saw the Orioles seven times. Uh, first game was actually an exhibition game against the New York Mets. It wasn't an official game. That was played Friday, April 3rd, 1992. Now, three days later was the official opening against the Cleveland Indians, but it was hard to get tickets. I couldn't see that person sure. on Washington TV. But over that season, I went to six official games, and guess what? The Orioles won all seven of those games. They should have kept going. I know. <laughs> <laughs> they could have won a better. Yeah. They finished in third place out of seven teams that year. That's if right. If you've gone more, you might have won, right? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, anyhow, the, the, the Easter curse, we'll call it. <laughs> oh, well, and, uh, and back in 71, that year, I remember going to seven Oriole games also, and they won all seven. Uh, I went to four regular season games, one playoff, and as I said before, two of the World Series games against the Pirates. I went to game one and game six. But I did not have a ticket for game seven. <laughs> if you did, it would have been a totally different story. I tell you what, if the Orioles get tight in this year, I'm going to come pick you up. We're going to go to an okay. Orioles game okay. just for yes. the good luck, Charles. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> oh, but uh, it, is, it is wonderful, the game of baseball, our national pastime, and so special, and really does have such a fascinating history, the baseball does, and a special feeling, you know, fans in every every city, every ballpark. And now I know you've been to a number of ballparks around the country, haven't you? Yeah, so, so every year uh, for the past 12 years, I have tried, um, I might have skipped a year in 2020 for uh, COVID-19, but we have, uh, my buddy of mine, uh, so I grew up in Ohio, I spent some time in California, and actually went to the last game ever at Qualcomm Stadium for the Padres, oh, yes. so we had that that honor as yes. well to see the last day of the stadium, of the stadium history, which we didn't yeah. know. Right. Uh, right. But I did go to the final game. I lived in San Diego for a while, so I, I, I met a friend out there who's a Dodgers fan, uh, lives in Los Angeles, uh, that area. And every year we meet somewhere in the United States. Uh, one day it'll be in Canada because we're going to go to Toronto. Yeah. Um, but we go and see new ballparks, and we are. Uh, we are hometown fans for the night. We'll buy a hat for the hometown team. Oh, uh, we are just appreciate the sport. We like to see the the monuments and the different stadiums. And I will also say we like to, to try a sampling of local beers while we, we're there. We feel like that's part yeah. of the culture as well. Sure. Uh, but yeah, we've seen a number of ballparks around the country, and I'm fortunate that we've seen some that have uh, are not there anymore. And I got a chance to go, and, and then we've seen the new ones as well. Well. On, my, on two times I went to Canada, I got to go to uh, Montreal. The old bar park, ballpark there was Jerry Stadium, Jerry or something, before they used Olympic Stadium. Yeah, Olympic. See, yeah, I went yeah. to the Olympics in 1976 in Montreal. Enjoyed that very much. So that year, they're obviously using the, Olymp the Olympic Stadium for the track and field. They didn't have it ready for baseball yet. But while there, I went to one Montreal Expos game at old Jerry Park. And played the Chicago Cubs that night, and of course the Montreal Expos have become the Washington Nationals. And uh, I also went to Toronto once and saw a game. They beat the Yankees two to one. And I lived in Boston part of 1975-76, and saw a number of games at Fenway Park, yeah. including the opening game of the 1975 World Series on October 7th, wow. October 11th, 1975. 
he hits a well Carlton Fisk he hits a big home run the sixth game a few days later. But right. yeah, I saw the Oakley game in person and the rest on TV. It was pretty exciting. That I was huh? at a bar watching that when Fisk hit that home run. Wow. Uh, to send it send it to seven games, but the Reds still won the next night. They came back. Big red Reds. machine, hard hard to beat. Right. <laughs> Well, no, it's, it's great. Uh, I'm so happy you came to share yes. baseball memories today. Absolutely. And thank you very much. Thanks for having me. I enjoyed it very much, sharing our baseball memories. This is Phil Easter, the Amazing Memory Man. We'll see you next time. Another story on another subject. Thank you, and have a good evening.